<clears throat> Thanks a lot for the introduction, and that's a really useful reference that I have to look up. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, so I'm gonna, um, basically I'm gonna keep this pretty casual. Um, I decided to show you more of the process and kind of behind the scenes of um, the way I work, because I think it's gonna be hopefully more interesting in this context than for you. Um, and <clears throat> I'm going to show like only a few pieces that are the most recent ones and I think the most like relevant um, <clears throat> to what you're doing, hopefully. Um, <clears throat> so this piece is called um, Still Life with Yam Yams. Uh, it's one of the um, first uh, simulation pieces I did. Um, and here... The, the logic behind the piece is based on um, <coughs> uh, uh, a research by Carl Sims uh, that he did in about 1994, I believe, uh, called Evolving Creatures, uh, where basically uh, he started to describe a system for uh, teaching generative creatures to be able to... Uh, uh, to have like a generative locomotion system inside a given 3D environment. And the way that system works is basically a bunch of creatures are created using um, <coughs> using 3D primitives like cubes or spheres and capsules. Uh, and then uh, muscles uh, or artificial muscles are generated between these parts. And then the muscles are uh, trained over generations um, <clears throat> until the creatures evolve and eventually manage to navigate this environment effectively. Uh, and there is a, a natural selection-like process where the best ones of each generation are kept uh, and uh, proceed with the evolution of them. Um, <clears throat> And then I kind of like started by recreating some of these experiments um, in the game engine. I'm using Unity game engine, by the way, in my work. Um, <clears throat> and then once I had, um, once I saw some emergent behaviors coming out of these creatures, I decided to kind of do some landscape design for them and create this environment for them to live in. Um, and generally, these kind of pieces are usually, um, they're infinite loops because they are, or they're of infinite duration. Um, and I usually uh, decide, I usually show them together with the computer that the simulation is running on live. Uh, so there is uh, some kind of visual hint um, <clears throat> of how the, of, that the piece is running live and it's not a video. Uh, and usually the, the computer playing the piece is also like, uh, I consider it a sculpture as well. So it's, I usually make um, some modifications on the PCs and I build them from scratch. Um, so here's a short clip from the piece. Start over here. So here you will see, um, uh, these are all the creatures. They are actually, um, 
when the peace begins there is kind of like a small population of that's randomly generated of about 20 to 30 creatures uh, and each of them has a randomized DNA that kind of um, maybe I have to stop this sound for a second um, and then basically the DNA of each creature uh, defines uh, both their behaviors or their starting behaviors uh, which is basically controlling how far they can see, how strong they are, how fast they are and um, a sequence of muscle twitches that they can use to move around in the space and then it also defines their uh, their appearance uh, kind of like picking from a, from a library of different uh, objects, colors, and combinations of them. Uh, and once once the piece starts, usually the creatures are not very good at what they're doing. They will be very sleepy and very like tired, and they won't be able to explore the world much. Uh, and uh, but as the piece progresses, and usually it can run for like uh, from a few hours to a few days, depending on. Uh, on when it crashes, and I will talk about that in a second. Um, and then each of these creatures is looking for its ideal mate, uh, and then it's trying to reproduce. So you will see some of them uh, reproducing, and when they reproduce, they will create a child that is a combination of its parents' DNA. So, <clears throat> uh, yeah, over time you will notice that the creatures start, start to, be to become more active and are able to navigate this world more efficiently. Um, I didn't want to have like some hard way of controlling the population. Uh, so there is the potential of the piece crashing depending on, um, for instance, when there is a, <clears throat> a particular strain of, of DNA that becomes very prevalent and a huge population of the creatures starts popping out. Uh, there is a possibility that the software will crash. Uh, but there is this uh, red worm that is flying around, which you will see occasionally coming by, uh, which is only attempting to control the population by, for instance, looking for orgies and trying to stop them. Um, <coughs> yeah, it's this, this little guy. Um, and then in terms of the iconography itself, like the, the, references, the visual references, you might notice um, that there is a lot of references in <coughs> video game tropes, which you will see that is kind of a continuous uh, reference in my work. Uh, so I kind of imagine this piece as, um, I imagine it as a, gamer's desktop that's somehow been abandoned and I imagine like this gaming computer that is just dreaming on its own and this is kind of what it's dreaming about. Um, so that is this piece um, <coughs> and which uh, shortly after led to this one um, called How to Everything. Um, here I was mainly interested in a couple of things. One was computational humor and how like we can create systems that are uh, visually interesting and funny in ways. And at the same time, I was looking a lot at YouTube culture and how um, it seems like through multiple vloggers and multiple people posting in, on YouTube, there seems to have uh, there. There seems to be an emergent language uh, or way of video editing that has um, kind of come up and is very characteristic of YouTube videos. And to my mind, that is like really fast cuts, really like a lot of like random actions happening at the same time. Um, <clears throat> so I thought of this as an exercise of how how can I create like a generative piece that can keep up with this kind of pacing and can, um, in a way, act as a visual hook uh, for people to want to look at for an extended period of time. Um, <coughs> uh, here, this piece is also a live simulation, but is slightly different from the previous one. Um, here, 
uh, there is a library of different objects, uh, about 50 or 60, uh, and they have like a wide range um, of objects, and each of the objects has its own behavior that's attached to it. So for instance, there is a hand, which is um, basically a motion capture set with that I performed with my own hand, and the hand is uh, looking for objects to caress or touch or poke. Um, there is, for instance, like animals and dinosaurs that are trying to avoid danger. Um, there is a knife that is looking for things to slice. There is generally like um, a physics engine that is kind of like animating everything. And from this physics engine, we get some uh, events and triggers that can um, <clears throat> that can make the kind of narrative or the non-existing narrative uh, progress. Um, yeah, and this is usually shown uh, on a large-scale projection, uh, but I've also shown it on screens. Um, this was the first time it was shown here in. Uh, New White Gallery, and here it was at the Venice Biennial. Um, but uh, it kind of like works well in a large scale. Um, so here's an excerpt of this one. Yeah, so this one also, um, yeah, so as you notice, like, whenever there is a film cut and, like, there is a new scene introduced, some of the objects from the previous scene are deleted and some new objects are introduced. And then they are left to interact with each other freely based on their behaviors. Uh, so it's kind of like a consistent, um, like, weird narrative that's going on. And I was also very interested in this idea of the traditional idea of montage in cinema uh, and how like our brains are trying to connect the action in between film cuts and how we are like kind of subliminally trying to project some kind of narrative action happening. Uh, but this piece in a way is completely like uh, denying us this narrative and it's all always like something that we're trying to project on it. Um, yeah, and also I was interested in uh, the idea of flatness that kind of like comes from the tradition of painting uh, and was interested in uh, exploring some of these concepts in a um, generative piece. Uh, so here there is, um, there is this kind of two and a half D space where it's it, it has like some thickness to it which is uh, when you see it on a screen for instance it kind of implies like a certain depth of the screen uh, but at the same time it's very flat and it has a lot of these like UI elements and 
painting brush strokes that enforce um, the two dimensionality of the whole scene. Um, Uh, moving forward, um, uh, together with my friend and collaborator Alex Rickett, um, we were invited by Adult Swim to make an online game for their website. Uh, so this is Gecko Redemption. Uh, it's a browser online multiplayer game. Uh, it's free to play and you can actually like check it out if you want. Um, <coughs> and here... Uh, we were interested in like making an actual game that is fun to play and is like potentially uh, really exciting to play with a large crowd. Um, <clears throat> it's for up to eight players per per match, and then I think the server supports a total of two thousand players at the same time. Um, and it's all browser-based, so you don't have to install anything. You can just play in your browser. Um, and then I will explain the mechanics in a second. Um, but then we were asked to show this in the Hammer Museum, in the UCLA uh, Game Art Festival. Uh, so we built this cage for two people to play at the same time. Um, and then... We did this kind of like um, underground cockfighting arena situation where we gave everyone fake money and we had this like announcer who was uh, describing the match. We had like a large projected screen that was showing what is happening and people were placing bets on whoever they thought was going to win. Um, and then... The game itself feels very claustrophobic and um, uh, disorienting. So we thought that it would be nice to express the same feeling for the players while they're playing. So that's why we came up with this like really like constricted space and that has the possibility of spinning around and making people even more sick. Um, and this is like a trailer of the game. Yeah, so this is like pretty, uh, pretty like crazy action. Like you have this gecko character that is third person and first person at the same time. You can climb on objects, so like you can basically travel through space freely, and this is super disorienting. And on top of that, you can also like shoot objects that are sticky to create like bridges and structures in space. And you can shoot lasers, and then you have to play this game of that is roughly equivalent of capture the flag. So you have to capture these different spheres in space. Um, and then imagine that with eight players at the same time, it can become like super crazy. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I have been like generally been really inspired by gaming culture, but not I don't necessarily make games very often. Uh, <clears throat> but what I liked, uh, uh, what I really enjoyed from this process is that the gaming community is actually really active online and it's really looking for things that are uh, slightly more experimental or different than typical games. So what we saw is that with putting out these free games that people can play, there were a lot of people who discovered them and there were like small communities that were built around them. Um, this is uh, another piece. Uh, that was also released online, uh, and you can also find and play. Uh, it was originally created for VR, but there's also like a non-VR version. Um, this is a slightly more narrative piece. Uh, it begins from this uh, gigantic 3D scan of myself. 
Um, and then it's kind of uh, playing with this idea of um, kind of um, na uh, narrative choices in games and how like there is usually a pretty narrow decision tree in vi traditionally in video games where you can make some decisions but in the end usually it's like everything is the same or there is like a few different endings that can possibly happen. Um, so I was playing with this idea a little bit. So there is a, uh, there is a narrative voiceover um, happening and depending on how the player navigates the space, there is like a few different uh, audio vignettes that can happen. Um, and a lot of them are kind of ironic or like talking about the act of taking meaningless choices um, and decisions. Uh, the second scene is this interior scene and there's a third scene. Uh, this was like um, the way it was exhibited recently uh, in a small group show in a toilet. Uh, uh, these are the controls. Uh, and this is uh, this is a let's play video of someone else playing the game. Years of evolutionary advancement. And then we have Cassie. This is like weirdly creepy and weirdly erotic. We're going in. Happy day, I'm good. <laughs> and today we're gonna get to know a man on a very intimate level. We're not just gonna get to know him on the outside. We're going inside. It's gonna be a very sexual experience. Let's just take a look at him. Oh, a nice palm tree. Oh, there he is. He's not. He's not the cutest guy, but he is my type. He's got, you know, the blue eyes with the gold in the middle. It's so dreamy. Not sure what's going on with his head up top, but I ain't judging. I'm into this. I can see you. He can see me? Wait. His eyes are following me. Closer. We're gonna- oh, hey bud, we're gonna get to know each other real good. Give you some skincare tips or something. Cause that- those- that dryness is just- oh, it's so creepy how the eyes follow me. The dryness is bad, um, the veins, it's okay though. <laughs> I'm just gonna go around and see what you're all about. Um, yeah, so I was like really, really uh, excited when this type of video started coming out because in a way it was like, um, it, this, is some, this is a type of reaction that you don't usually get by showing pieces in a gallery, so it was like a way to get like a lot of feedback and like see people's comments and see like how people perceive the work which is very different from like showing art in a gallery and everyone being like hmm uh so <clears throat> it is definitely something i i want to pursue more and i want to like become more engaged in um this is uh, another VR piece uh, called Staphyloculus. Um, uh, in this next couple of pieces, I'm gonna show a little bit more of the process of making them. Um, here I was, I guess the piece kind of began by um, when I first started playing with the Vive headset, which is slightly, um, is slightly better than previous headsets I was using. Uh, and then I got to try Google Earth in VR. I'm not sure if people have tried it here. Uh, but for me, it was a very interesting experience of um, kind of uh, flying to places that I already know, like that are very familiar, and seeing them through this very melty 3D scan version that, that they have in Google Earth. But at the same time, even though they were like really melty and really low resolution, you could still somehow feel a sense of space and a sense of, oh, this is the actual space that I am that I have in my memory right now. Uh, so that was like um, like a very uh, I was very excited about uh, where what I can do with that idea and whether it's like actually possible to to combine uh like virtual spaces with spaces of our memory in a in a way um so i this project kind of began by taking a um a whole um vr system 
with a power generator and a computer and all these like um, sensors <clears throat> out in the desert in a location in Joshua Tree that I liked. Uh, and then uh, basically, yeah, these are some screenshots from the experience that we'll see in a second. Um, yeah, and then kind of uh, going there with a small crew and doing a um, detailed 3D scan of the area. Uh, we used a drone and a couple of DSLRs and like just tried to get as much, uh, as many photos as we could from all different perspectives. Um, <clears throat> and then using photogrammetry software, uh, try to, oh, my slides are messed up. Uh, try to like, make a relatively accurate representation both in terms of scale and uh, as good of a 3D scan as possible. Uh, and then basically that scan was placed in VR in the same location. We tried to match it as well as, as, well as possible, but of course that's never uh, exactly possible. Uh, so uh, in the second phase of the project, I basically was in this VR scene that was this rough approximation of the physical space, uh, but it was on site. And then a lot of interesting things started happening where um, <clears throat> I could like touch objects in the physical world that would have, that would be like touching a 3D model. And then there was wind and sun and temperature and everything was sort of matching, but sort of not matching. Um, so it was like um, <clears throat> a very weird mental exercise, kind of. Uh, and then what I tried to do is basically uh, translate that experience into a VR experience that other people can, can see and it can be distributed. And of course, then I put like a few extra things in there just to make it more exciting. Um, and that's uh the final piece or the teaser for the piece Um, yeah, it's not shown very well right here, but then uh, there is a second part of the VR experience where um, a 360 video recording of me having the same experience in the desert is embedded in the 3D scene. So, and you can interact with the video playback. So the, the video documentation kind of becomes an object in the 3D space. Um, and then another thing that I was really interesting, uh, ex interested in exploring in this one was the sense of embodiment in VR. So <clears throat> you might have noticed that by default in a lot of VR experiences, uh, it is assumed that you don't have a body, like you are this invisible presence in the scene. Sometimes you have your controllers, sometimes you're just basically a camera in space. Um, so I was interested in uh, subverting that and seeing like what happens when uh, we have this assumption and we start this piece by not having a body, but then suddenly these weird creatures start attacking us and attaching to our invisible body and eventually actually form a body for us. Uh, and there's the, there is this um, small screen inside the scene and there is like the player's uh, shadow, so you can kind of understand that you are suddenly an embodied presence in space. 
and then once you have like a moment to be comfortable with that with your new body uh all these all these creatures start popping <coughs> and disappearing so then you kind of lose the body again and uh from people's reactions to the piece it seems like this actually is a uh, brings out kind of a very visceral feeling of of being embodied and then suddenly disappearing um and these are all kind of themes that um uh seem to be going somewhere with this piece and i decided to start expanding on them a little bit um so this is uh my latest piece uh it's actually a series of works. Um, they began with uh, the creation of this orc character. <clears throat> um, I was interested in uh, thinking about what would be my ideal body in a virtual space and what would be uh, what would be like a good representation of me. Um, <clears throat> and I wanted to try out some things um, <clears throat> um <clears throat> and i was also interested in um kind of exploring some of um the some of some other video game tropes and how the body is usually like represented uh in video games and in 3d environments uh so i decided to use this software called das 3d i don't know if you're familiar with it but it's basically a parametric character creator uh where you get a base body uh that can either be male or female uh and then <clears throat> you get a bunch of parameters uh that you can play around with in sliders to create your character and that is these parameters typically are like um, masculinity, uh, uh, percentage of um, <coughs> how tall and wide the character is, um, how um, emancipated or pregnant the character is, um, and then you uh, there is also a store where you can buy a few like extra features for the body. Uh, so I've been like tinkering with this software for a while and I was always like, uh, very amazed by just how weird it is and how this like market that's built around it, uh, works. Um, <clears throat> so I just did a session where I tried to like not censor myself much and not think about it and just like play with the sliders until I felt like what I see is a good virtual representation and this is what I came up with um, and then at the same time um, I was interested in orcs in particular and how uh, they are like usually the stupid and bad guys in both like uh, fantasy fiction and in video games and how like usually the um, the type of stuff they create and they're all like um, uh, equipment and structures and weapons are all like they all have like a very specific aesthetic to them uh, and they always seem like very like simple and effective at destroying things. I, I thought also that this is like um, a really funny version of modernism and form follows function where like you try you make this like really brutal war machine by just making it in the simplest way possible um <clears throat> and then uh, at the same time i was asked to do a solo show in a new york gallery that didn't exist yet um so uh, and this is a gallerist called Meredith Rosen that I've been working with for a while. Uh, she is uh, like starting this new space in New York that's really awesome, but it didn't exist yet. So she, um, I went there and visited, took some photos, got the plans of how it is going to be. Uh, and then I recreated the space. Um, <coughs> I recreated the space 
uh, in VR and I decided to do um, type of artist residency in the space until the show was actually up. So I basically uh, got myself this avatar, got myself this studio to work in. Uh, I was actually like living and working in this space in VR for about six months. Um, and then this began as some like exercises of um, kind of being this avatar, uh, having a mirror and trying to like, uh, like look at myself and this avatar and try to start understanding how it feels to be this character and also like um, kind of starting to like understand the way the motion capture system works. I, I built a DIY motion capture system based on uh, the Vive headset and the Vive trackers um, <clears throat> that allowed me to have like um, kind of crude but generally working version of uh, my body in VR. Um, and then I started equipping the studio with uh, with tools and different like 3D models. Some of them I made from scratch. Some of them I collected from various sources. Um, and I gave each of the objects like a few um, a few different properties. Uh, and then I started working in that space um, and trying to come up with sculptures. Um, and I built this whole like interaction system that I allowed, allowed me to, uh, basically be in VR and work with these objects. And at the same time, I built a system that allowed me to record, uh, everything in 3D, uh, including my body and then all the interactions in time and space. Uh, so I basically, that basically means that I would get like, uh, a scene in unity and I would <coughs> uh, be in it for like 15 minutes or half an hour and I would record the whole session and I would have like I could play back the whole scene without me being there um, and and then I also like started working with the character and kind of like thinking of starting to think of incorporating this orc aesthetics into the sculptures themselves and also like starting to think like that character and starting to um, try to imagine what kind of work they would make instead of me. Uh, <clears throat> so this kind of ended up uh, being this uh, installation. Uh, it's a room scale installation that has a few various components. Um, <clears throat> one component is these sculptures that are actually 2D. So these are, uh, prints on plywood. Um, I kind of printed directly on the plywood and CNC the outlines, uh, so that there would be some interesting materiality to these objects. So you can see, if you go close to them, you can see the print and you can also see the wood grain of the plywood at the same time. So they are uh, these weird uncanny objects. And also um, I basically uh, did some uh, basic set design or perspective studies where the moment you would enter the gallery for, um, for like a split second, you would get confused by the perspective and feel like these objects are actually three dimensional. Um, and I was also like always, um, always interested in how these virtual objects are translated in physical space. Um, <clears throat> and I thought that, uh, as you will see, like the way the orc works in space is very like, uh, really messy and like throwing things around and like making like fast and brutal, uh, gestures. So it's very like, bad boy art in the sense that like Mike Kelly would do or like other of the like uh, generation of bad boy artists would do, but it's kind of like a, it's a ironic gesture towards that. Um, <clears throat> and then I thought that it would be sort of nonsensical to make this 
big sculptures by 3D printing them, even if 3D printing was actually uh, possible at that scale and definition. Um, <clears throat> and I thought that flattening the objects would actually be more interesting for the space. And the second component of the installation was this uh, monitor stand. Uh, there were a couple of these in the space. Uh, and the way these work are, I see them as, as like viewing apparatuses or um, portals to this uh, virtual layer. Uh, they are also using the Vive system for tracking. So uh, we kind of know where exactly the, the monitors are in space and where they are looking. So they're kind of like augmented reality on gigantic iPhones, I guess. Um, and then people were, f were like welcome to move these monitors around by using these handles. Uh, and also I, I like to incorporate the org aesthetics also in these as objects. Um, and playing like with raw construction materials and like making these like very precarious connections between things and also like leaving the technology exposed so people can kind of trace all the cabling and understand how, how this thing works. Um, and then this is another one of the series that I showed uh, at Freeze New York. Uh, here you can maybe see a little bit of a close-up uh, and the way that the wood grain is uh, uh, is visible at the same time with the print. Um, and this is a video of the motion, the screens in action. Yeah, so here I forgot to mention that. Uh, what you see on the screens is the actual like three-dimensional recording of the process of the art character building this sculpture. So it's kind of, uh, yeah, the sculptures are augmented by the process that made them. Um, and then I, I, one of the reasons I, I came up with this, uh, with this viewing device is because I've always had problems with uh, showing this kind of virtual spaces in a gallery context. Um, so uh, basically, I always found it problematic that when you show a VR piece in a gallery, there is like a line of people waiting and then there is someone that is awkwardly wearing a dirty headset and they have to like be there being watched by other people uh, and all this kind of like um, <coughs> boring reality of making a VR piece work in this context. And at the same time, I have similar feelings about AR in the sense that you have to either have like a specific device which ends up being pretty small or you need to have everyone install something on their phones, which also kind of becomes a burden or a like um, complicated process when you have like a lot of people viewing the piece. And both AR and VR in this context tend to be sort of um, very single player experiences. Whereas I thought of um, I, I thought of this apparatus as a more uh, multiplayer version of that where multiple people have to do this kind of like push and pull choreography to to be able to view the piece together um and then also in the same series um i did a painting piece i have like really strong feelings about painting i just don't get it in generally uh so i thought that the best way to to deal with these feelings would be to do a painting myself and see if what this does and uh, like if I come to any conclusions about it. Um, and then this was also like a similar process where I built some painting tools and this large canvas on plywood that was then 
um, fabricated uh, in exactly the same dimensions and uh, materiality that's very close to the virtual piece. And it had an embedded monitor this time that was actually showing a more like linear uh, video or like a fixed perspective uh, video recording. Uh, and there was like a, a, a bit of layering and a few like different materials overlaid. Uh, and this is uh, the video itself. Yeah, I guess a big part of this conversation is like dealing with this surface. Like, you know, we are, we perceive space and then have to have to place our ideas two-dimensionally on a painting. That's hard. I think I'm done with green. Maybe I'm gonna try some braver strokes. Maybe something like this. Yeah, that's good. It's good, isn't it? Guess you have to go back here and evaluate. Evaluate how it looks so far. So, yeah, I mean, definitely need something more. I guess. I guess a big part of this conversation is like about the artist's body and and this like gestures that are somehow expressing the, the embodiment of the paint. Is that right? Yeah, maybe I should try something even more gestural. Like some splashes here and there. Yeah, that feels good. That feels pretty good. I think it needs something. Yeah, that's kind of how it goes. <laughs> Um, yeah, and then the the finished piece is actually like just basically a high resolution screenshot of that same uh, of that same thing I was doing in the video, and the whole video is a one take, so it's the actual like ten minutes that it took to make the painting. Um, so uh, and it was interesting to see pe people interacting or like viewing the piece because. I, I noticed quite a few people being like trying to trace every every stroke in the video and like being like how can this be exactly the same? Uh so it was fun to like see people interact with it. Um okay and I think that kind of uh concludes <laughs> concludes uh my lecture but I think we have a lot of time to to discuss uh any questions and uh, uh, <coughs> ideas you might have on this. <laughs>